Welcome back to Talking Stuff, everyone. My name is Jeremy Birmingham. That is Spencer Holbrook. This is the Ohio State Recruiting Podcast brought to you by Letterman Rowe and our good friends at Byers Automotive. If you're looking for an auto, go to Byers Auto. Spencer, it's uh, Friday afternoon. The Buckeyes have added commitment number three to the class in 2022 with C.J. Hicks, a four-star linebacker from Kettering uh, Archbishop Alter High School outside of Dayton. Very, very close to Dayton, but not nonetheless. Um, Hicks was offered by Ohio State two weeks ago. He's, a, as I said, a class of 2022. Um, he was on Dermonology two weeks ago and said he was going to wait till the end of his junior year to make a decision and that he needed to, to explore all of his options. And here we are two weeks later, and he's committed to the Buckeyes. And that was just after one virtual visit with the coaching staff. As a kid who grew up in Ohio, like myself, and who you know had dreams of being an athlete, how long would it have taken for you to commit to Ohio State if they offered you a scholarship? It wouldn't have. It would have been it just would, like it, on the spot. Yeah, it, it'd be like a Jair Brown. It would have been like a like that. Uh, you know, one visit would have been uh, Tegra t- to, Shab- to Shabola. Is that how you mm-hmm. say that? Like I mean, these guys sure. are these guys. They obviously see the, the pool that Ohio State offers. Um, then you uh, obviously there are different cases. You got your Jackson Carmens. You've got even your Tyreek Smiths who end up at Ohio State but need to weigh their options because they're not actually from Ohio. But when you're from Ohio, it's like the Reed Carrico syndrome. When you're from Ohio and you get that offer, it it just means something different. It's like being from Louisiana and going to LSU. It's like uh, you know the big three in Florida or, or Oklahoma and Oklahoma State and Oklahoma. You know when when you get offered, it's not like a Southern California deal. When you get offered by that in-state school that you've grown up worshiping almost when you talk about Ohio state and people in Ohio, it's really hard to say no when they say, Hey, this is a committable offer. Yeah. I think what I find most fascinating about it is how we're so conditioned right now in this recruiting game and in the, the world, the business of recruiting that when kids get offers, you almost cannot expect them to say things like, I'm going to take my time. I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to wait this out. I want to explore all my options, but there's still this undercurrent of obviousness to what's happening. I mean, because, especially, as you said, in a place like Ohio, we grew up here. Like, you get that opportunity, and you're a kid who has, has been a fan of Ohio State your whole life. And, I, you know, I talked to, to Hicks about his decision, and, um, you know, you can check that out on, on, on our YouTube page. But he was talking about how he works out sometimes with Braxton Miller. Like, if, if you're an Ohio kid, especially a 16-year-old, Seven, eight years ago, when he, he's learning about sports, he was watching Braxton Miller play football for the Buckeyes. And um, now I, I don't think that there's any, um, any real mystery as to why these kids decide, hey, you know what, I want to, to wait it out, but I'm just not going to. Like, it's, it, go ahead. It's the same thing. Like, I'm not going to lie, when I decided to go into journalism at Ohio U, like I went to Ohio U because the journalism school is better, but like if I would have been able to get into main campus as a freshman, like I was going to go to Ohio state. Like yeah. you just, it's like the dream is like go to Ohio state, even if it's not for athletics. And like, even when it is for athletics, like, we, you know, I, my dad and I used to throw the football in the backyard and it's like, it's weird to say this now because he's the, uh, the wide receivers coach, but it's like, Hey dad, I'm going to be Brian Hartline and run across the middle right now. And it's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Run that route. And I'm like right. seven years old in my backyard. Like, that's what every kid in Ohio does when, when, uh, you know, Dane Sansenbacher is catching passes and in crucial passes or Anthony Gonzalez is going up to make a big catch against Michigan. Like you're making that play as that person in your yard, or, you know, you're making the Braxton Miller spin move. Now these kids, because they're obviously far younger than we are, like you're making the Braxton Miller spin move in your yard. You're not saying like, Oh, let me be Lamar Jackson for a second. It's like, let me be whatever the Buckeye is that's, that yeah. is right now. And so when that offer comes and there's just that, that, that piece of that piece in the back of your mind, it's like, I just got offered by Ohio state and you're an in-state kid. It's, it's like the recruiting cycle is so crazy and we think that it's never ending and people want to take their time and it's going to be a carousel of what's going on. But like, in a sense, it's still like 1975 almost when you get that offer from Ohio state and you're an in-state kid, it, it it's like transcendent. And that's yeah. why it's so crazy to me. Like when you look at different States 
Like if you look at like the state of Michigan or the state of Kentucky or the state of Tennessee, like you don't see that as much. And it's crazy to me that Ohio state has that kind of pool, obviously in its own state, but like that just shows you how strong the program is. Everyone watches on Saturdays. And so like for a kid like CJ Hicks, like you said, when you're 16 years old and you're working out with the guy you idolize as an eight, nine year old, and he's, you know, he went to Ohio state. It, it's a no brainer. You're going to Ohio state. Yeah. And I, the Buckeyes have, have, I think avoided some of that slowdown in like in-state love affair because the Buckeyes have continued to be a winning program throughout this last decade where Michigan, Tennessee, et cetera, some of those schools haven't. So these kids are seeing, they're growing up in an era where they're watching and say, Hey, there's an opportunity for me to go somewhere else and excel. But kids that don't in state in Ohio, like they don't need to. And that's what CJ told me was I knew where I was going to end up anyway. So why wait it out and risk losing out? And why, why not just be a part of it now? Um, you know, and that now sets up what could be an interesting few weeks for Ohio State. I mean, you're talking about the class of 2022 who 10 days ago had zero commitments. Now it has three. You look at Gabe Powers from Marysville is another guy that they've offered. Blake Miller up in Strongsville, another guy they've offered. You know, these kids are going to start building this class, and the Buckeyes are going to be put in a position, I think, where um, you're going to see more local offers because that's who they've had a chance to watch as opposed to national names that they don't feel like they're going to commit. But it's big for Ohio State. It's huge for C.J. Hicks. You're talking about a six foot four, 212-pound, soon-to-be junior, a kid that could probably end up in the 6'4", 235, 240 range by the time he's on campus at Ohio State with two more years of grooming, two more years of growing. You're looking at this Darren Lee-type player athletically in a Malik Harrison-type body. Um, so – the sky is really the limit for Hicks, who returns punts, he returns kicks, he plays running back, he, he's a, an athlete that's on the field all the time for Alter. Um, and I think a player Buckeyes fans would be really excited about. I think sometimes what happens, Spencer, is that when we're dealing with in-state kids, because it's expected that they're supposed to commit to Ohio State, I think that there's a almost like a lessened enthusiasm when they do, because it, it just seems to be part of the natural process. But as a player and as a big time potential goes, it's hard to find uh, any kids in Ohio who have the upside that CJ Hicks does. Yeah. It, it's, it's really interesting because I'm, you know, I always go back to the Mayan Williams recruitment. Everybody's so down on Ohio state, but Mayan Williams is a good running back. He's from in state though. So nobody thinks of him as a good running back because it was just expected for him to be at Ohio state. So, you know, these guys want to get in the class early. It's better for Ohio state. It helps build momentum in a time where momentum's hard to come by in a, the class of 2022. Nobody can scout this class right now. Nobody can really watch this class right now, and the Buckeyes are already building it. So uh, the momentum they're, they're, they have in 2021 has to play a part in this, but I just feel like this 2022 class is off to a pretty good start for, for uh, given the circumstances. Yeah, only LSU has more commitments than Ohio State now in the class of 2022. Uh, the Tigers have four. Ohio State has three with the addition of C.J. Hicks. Moving on from that, let's talk about the, the biggest – conversation of the week, I guess, has been the recruitment of J.C. Latham, uh, Ohio State's top remaining target at offensive tackle in the class of 2021, who uh, has been for a while, most people have thought, was just a matter of time before he committed to the Buckeyes. And now all of a sudden, there appear to be some, some breaks in, in that chain and a little bit of chink in the armor. Uh, we've seen reports this week that Oklahoma, LSU, and Alabama are all getting very involved. The Oklahoma side of things is actually reporting that Ohio State is running fourth in that battle. I don't buy that, but I do buy, Spencer, that things have changed. Um, you know, Lason had intended to commit on April 18th. The coronavirus pandemic uh, forced him to miss a couple key visits to LSU and Ohio State in early April. That, I think, has caused him to back up and take some, some uh, new looks at things. Alabama has been all over him, especially with the NFL draft and their need for offensive linemen and the way that uh, they produce them, telling him that Ohio State has too many offensive tackles, that he's in a better position if he goes to Alabama. It's a better business decision. Uh, there, are some, there are some family dynamics in play here for J.C. Latham that um, have changed some of the circumstance, and that's not really here nor there, but – there's a lot of things going on in that young man's life. And I think people are probably overwhelming him uh, with expectation and pressure right now. And I think that 
that could be leading to a, a decision that says, hey, I need to slow things way down, um, which I think the Buckeyes are okay with because he's known that he's the top of their board uh, for the last eight months at the offensive tackle position. He's the only other offensive tackle they're really recruiting in the class other than Ben Christman, who's committed. Um, and so it's about maintaining right now for Ohio State and J.C. Latham, not necessarily panicking, but understanding when you're dealing against Alabama and LSU and Oklahoma and programs of that nature, uh, it's a difficult recruiting battle. And anybody who thought this was going to be easy because the kid likes Ohio State, I think uh, is getting caught up in just the hype and the momentum of what the Buckeyes have done in this class and not necessarily realizing that every recruitment is an individual's recruit. Yeah, the, the momentum has not stopped, but it's certainly slowed down a little just because, you know, not a, you can't get a commit every three days. That's just not how recruiting works. And so when you have J.C. Latham trying to make a decision, and like you said, the pressure is just – it seems like there's just so much pressure mounting on, hey, wh where's this kid going to go? What's the decision? You were supposed to make the decision in April. Where are you going? I think it is going to be one of those things where he just needs to slow it down. And I think Ohio State, if, if that's the case and that's what's going to happen, Ohio State's going to welcome that with open arms. Uh, yeah. If it's slowed down, that's a good news. For, that's good news for Ohio State. He'll be able to get there for another game or, a, you know, a, a summer visit. And I just think that that bodes well for Ohio State if, if they can hold off from him committing anytime soon. Yeah. I think the one thing that nobody wants is for any kid to make a decision based on what other people think he should do. Um, and so the timeline here, whatever it happens for, for Latham, and we don't really have any idea when that is, uh, is to understand that it's on his terms. Now, what you saw was like Corey Foreman, the number one ranked player in the country who decommitted from Clemson two weeks ago. You know, I read a report where he said he's still very interested in Clemson, but they're offering other defensive ends now. And if they end up taking one, then his spot could be gone. And even that, that's for a player who's a five-star player. Laysom is a five-star player, according to 247 Sports. And the Buckeyes may get in a position here in the next few weeks where they have to start evaluating other tackles, and then you have to wonder how that sets the wheel turning. So uh, I'm not saying by any measure that I think that the Buckeyes are no longer the favorite for J.C. Laysom, but that, that gap has tightened considerably. And I think people, um, if, if the belief is that this is all a smokescreen, then it, it could be. I don't personally believe that, and I think that the battle for Latham has really now just started. So, um, you know, one team that has really been picking it up when you're talking about battles is Tennessee. The volunteers have blown up in the last few days, four, four days, four commitments, including two names that are familiar to Buckeye fans, I'd imagine, with Kamar Wilcoxon and Terrence Lewis. Spencer, Terrence Lewis is a linebacker, five-star linebacker from Florida who everyone sort of expected to get a Buckeyes offer. Uh, last month and it didn't and then that relationship that was kind of starting to be built fell apart before it really kicked off what is it about Tennessee that you think is like drawing this kind of attention right now they're not playing football I don't know. it's a really easy recruiting pitch to say hey we're building something great it's like Maryland hey we're building something great we can be great here Jeremy Pruitt is a Saban disciple. We know how Saban disciples work on the recruiting trail. There's a lot of momentum there at certain points. And then we when, know how they work. <laughs> well, and that there's a lot of recruiting momentum there in the offseason. And then when they don't win, Alabama and Georgia and, and uh, even like Florida, South Carolina, some of those schools just come and take the guys that – and you know, Clemson, not South Carolina. Wow. But they take the guys that, that were committed. is in South Carolina. Oh, so. Yeah. Ohio State does the same thing when it comes to like Maryland and, and those kind of schools. But – they're just not playing football right now. And, and it's a really easy – it's a lot easier to recruit when you say, hey, we're going to be this than when you have to walk into a kid's home and say, hey, this is what we are right now. And yeah. I think that's – it's a sobering message in the fall when a guy is sold on, hey, we've got these shiny toys and we're going to be 9-3 and three or 10-2 and two and you're going to help us get to 11-1 and one and 12-0. and oh, And they go out on the field and you're 6-6 six and six and you're losing to BYU at Georgia State and all of a sudden it's – what, you know, what am I, what am I committed to Tennessee for? I'm not going to win a national championship. Maybe that's different. Maybe this is a Kirby smart deal where Jeremy Pruitt's building up toward making Tennessee what it, sh it probably should be in all honesty. Um, but I just, it's one of those things where I'll believe it when I see it. I, I think they're doing some pretty good things right now. Uh, Kamar Wilcoxon's a player Ohio State liked. Uh, Terrence Lewis is, is a player Ohio State liked on the field. Uh, so, I mean, if Tennessee can hold on to these guys, it's, it's, it'll be an interesting dynamic as a, 
maybe power starts to shift in favor of the SEC East with Florida and Georgia. And if Tennessee can be good, the SEC East could see a rise. But I just don't – I don't I, – I don't know whether to buy it or not right now because it's April. Yeah, I mean, it, to me it's a similar dynamic to what you're seeing out at USC. And it's a program that eight months ago was on the verge of firing its head coach um, and decided not to. They had a, a decent end to the season last year, so now there's this excitement. But – the fact is, if Tennessee goes out and starts off the season three and four or four and four, um, you're right, right back where you were last September and last October, same as USC. And then, you know, if Maryland goes out and Mike Loxley's program doesn't get markedly better, um, you're going to see a lot of these kids make this decision to, to reopen things or to look around. Maryland just added a commitment from Marcus Bradley, the defensive tackle who Ohio State was recruiting. Um, as well, the teammate of Damian Robinson. And, you know, the Buckeyes were not in a position right now where they would have said yes to Marcus Bradley, but it's a position where, similar to, to J.C. Latham, like you'd like them, if they're not sure of a choice, don't make a choice. Like, yeah, let things unfold. But when you're talking about Marcus Bradley, who's from Maryland, who's watching his teammates and friends in that area, all get on board with the Terrapins and it's starting to get a little momentum going. They're top 10 class right now. You start to wonder like how, do, how long does that sustain and how, you know, can that group actually get to the next point where they're building something? Randy Edsel had built something with Maryland back in 2015 um, and thought that they were going to have that group that included Dwayne Haskins and Keandre Jones and players like that taking them to the next step. And then Randy Edsel got fired and Dwayne Haskins and Keandre Jones ended up at Ohio State instead. So you just watch how this unfolds over the next few months. It's going to be interesting. We're getting a lot of Tennessee talk on the recruiting show right now. And I think it's interesting because Tennessee in its first month of the season next year, and I just looked it up because I wanted to make sure my facts were correct, but it is true. Tennessee goes to Norman and has to play at Oklahoma on the second week of the season. Then the day Ohio State will be at Oregon and Tennessee plays Florida two weeks later. If those are both losses, I can't imagine you can still sell a five-star linebacker from Miami who everyone in the SEC is recruiting that you're going to be the program where he's going to win national championships. I just find that very hard to believe. If you get trounced at Oklahoma and then Florida, who should be really good next year, beat you there, what, what are you selling? So I, I think uh, you know, kudos to Jeremy Pruitt, kudos to Tennessee, uh, that what they're doing on Rocky Top right now looks pretty good on the surface, but I think it's going to be hard to hold together when it's all said and done in December and in February when these guys are signing on the dotted line. Yeah, one of the things that I find most interesting is that there are so many stories on the recruiting trail that can't be told or that a lot of times momentum um, can be manufactured and – you know, you, you're in a position where you can celebrate and tell a tale to say this is how this is coming together, but it's not always accurate. Um, you know, Maryland got a big win with Damian Robinson, okay? Like, that was a big win. But if you look at Marcus Bradley, for example, like, I, again, I don't think that other top-tier programs that he was looking at would have said yes right now. So you have to wonder how that balances out. And and does it really matter? I guess not, because once the commitment happens, that guy's in the class and you're good to go. So um, the better the programs in the Big Ten can recruit, the better places like Maryland and Nebraska and Wisconsin and, and Michigan State, the better they recruit, in my opinion, the better it is for Ohio State. Yeah. Like, yeah, you and want better teams around you. Like, while we're still talking about this, like, Tennessee – for what it for what it's worth, despite what they went through last year with almost firing Jeremy Pruitt, and then all of a sudden he's going to be the savior of this recruiting cycle. Like they ended the 2020 recruiting cycle at a decent space. Like they're not, it's not like he is he's just maintaining what they have. Like he's right. elevating the program a little, at least a little bit. As of right now, these first couple of years of his tenure, I think the pro, their, that program has become elevated. And when you try and sell, hey, you get to play in the best conference in the country, you get to play in a uh, you know, in these stadiums, SEC stadiums, you get to play against NFL players. It's an easy sell. But like I said, once you get on the field, and like Maryland probably does the same thing. You get to play in the Big Ten. You get to play against all these NFL players. But once you get on the field, like 
Ohio State beat Maryland 62 to 3 a couple years ago. They beat them 76 to you no, know, 73 to 14 on the field in November. Like you can't just tell somebody like we're going to win a national championship when you're 60 yeah. points worse than than what well, than, I, I think that's what I'm saying. Like when you're talking about this stuff, you can sell whatever story you want. You can t- you can point to that 2018 Ohio State Maryland game and go look how close we were, right? But that's a- avoiding the 2016 62 to three game and the 2018 or 2017 62 to three game and the 2019 77 to four- 73 to 14 game. Like you're not close. And yeah, it- it's good to sell the players on that hope, but eventually. Um, the reality of the situation is revealed. And so what you need for a place like Maryland or Tennessee right now is for the administration to actually be supportive and say, we know there's going to be some bumps, but we're not going to hyper react and, and let and have to start over because that's impossible for Tennessee fans, right? You have to let that, that momentum build over the course of three, four years. If you're and, in those sort of programs. And the same thing can be said about, you know, we keep talking about it, Tennessee, which I think is a good comparison to what Maryland's doing right now. And the same can be said, like, they were a goal line fumble from being a touchdown down from Alabama. Like, they were in that game in 2019. But then Alabama can point to 2018. And they can point to, was it 2016, when Tennessee was ranked number nine in the country and Alabama beat them, like, 55 to nothing or whatever it was. Like, you can – Selective narratives are, are very real on the recruiting trail, but it all evens out at some point. Like, yeah, that's why, like, when Ole Miss had the 2015 class where they had all these five-star guys, it's like, oh, well, something's up because they're, they're not winning on the field, but they're getting all these five-star guys. It's like, well, Tennessee's not winning on the field. So, you know, the momentum's real right now. In Maryland, the momentum is real right now. I'll get, you know, you can, give, you can tip your hat while also being cautious. I just think that's yeah, what we need to do with both. Right. Guys. I mean, the, the reality is that reality is, and it's <laughs> go, it, it's going to um, come down to how things work out this fall whenever football gets back to being played. So, but as you said, right now, I think it's just interesting to watch as the world. I mean, Ohio State is on a perch right now, so much higher than everyone else when it comes to the twenty uh, twenty one class. So you kind of get this opportunity to sit and watch what everyone else is doing. And it is fascinating because Alabama is 40th ranked class in the country. Uh, you know, and then you see Tennessee and Georgia and Florida and these other schools keep plotting, plugging away. Tennessee did take the top ranked player in the state of Alabama and got a commitment from him last weekend. So you look at that and you say, okay, what's Jeremy Pruitt doing that Nick Saban isn't? And how is he getting the five-star linebacker from, from Alabama over the Crimson Tide? And then you wonder, like, does, is this really a changing landscape? Or come November, does it all settle back to where it is or supposed to be? Well, because... And it's one of those things every year you say, what's going on at Alabama? What's going on at Alabama? Yeah. And then in December, they find themselves at the top of the recruiting board. Yeah, I mean, and we did have that same conversation last year. So It's a slow, methodical approach that they take, but uh, the SEC is not getting any worse. And the teams recruiting against Alabama aren't getting any worse. And Ohio right. State's not getting any, wor- getting any worse in the recruiting rankings. So, like, you have to wonder in this cycle more than others, like, what are the, those other, like you said, SEC schools doing that Alabama's not right now because you don't really see it. I mean, Alabama gets a lot of flips. I will say that. I wonder if it's just sort of, of their power move, honestly. Like, because when you're in that upper go, echelon. Go ahead. Get your guys. We'll, we'll, they'll come back. Right. When you're in that upper, that upper crust, like – why not wait and see who's really good in September and then go recruit them? Like they have, Bama can do that. Bama has the opportunity to just say, you know what? It, um, it, not that I'm saying that this is happening, but again, look at JC Latham. Like Alabama was not involved in that recruitment three weeks ago, at least not like on a, on a real level a month ago, they weren't involved. And now they're the team that from talking to people inside of the program at Ohio state, that that's the team that they're kind of like, Ooh, we've, here comes Bama. They have an ability to do things uh, um, in different ways than a lot of programs have been able to do things in different ways. And they're very good on the field as well. So, and they get guys in the NFL. So like they're, they have an ability to kind of flip that switch and say, okay, we're going to go right on this guy now and, and we'll make a difference. So 
Now, like like you said, it's not to say like Ohio State's afraid to recruit against Alabama because they're right. both on the same level as far as talent on the roster. So it's not like they can sell much of a different recruiting pitch on the surface. It's Ohio State's not afraid to recruit against Alabama. It's just, oh, here comes Bama. Now it's a real battle. Right. It's it's this um, forced belief, I guess, that you look at the NFL draft thing and you see the SEC has 63 guys. But, you know, Alabama didn't have more guys drafted than Ohio State. But the SEC is 63 and the Big Ten only has 48. And again, it's statistics, and you can make statistics say whatever you want, and that's why they're sometimes use, useless. But what you do know is that Ohio State is uh, working hard. We'll talk about the linebacker position and what the Buckeyes are doing there in the next few days when we catch back up on top of stuff the next time. But understand that there's a lot of battles that are coming between Ohio State and big-time powers in the SEC, including Alabama, Clemson, Georgia, LSU. So. And this is, that's the, the thing that, that is interesting to me that I'm really excited to watch over the next few months is Ohio State locked down 17 guys. And now instead of battling Penn State, Michigan, Notre Dame for the guys already in the area, now these 17 are locked in, and they're going to say, okay, we've taken care of these B-rated programs on the recruiting trail. Now they're going after LSU, Alabama, Clemson, Georgia, Florida. Uh, I would even say, you know, not that they're going against, but like they're going into Florida State territory. Yeah. I just think it's interesting. Like they took care of everybody they needed to take care of. They said, we're the bad boy on the block in the Midwest. Now let's get to the South and try some real recruiting battles. Coffee's for closers. And we're going to find out if Ryan Day's a closer in the next few months, I guess. Uh, Spencer Holbrook, I'm Jeremy Birmingham. This has been Talking Stuff, the Ohio State Recruiting Podcast, brought to you by Letterman Row and Byers Automotive. If you're looking for an auto, go to Byers Auto. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening, folks. We'll catch you next time. Have a good one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe below to get the latest videos from Letterman Row. We've got Letterman Live. We've got the practice report. We got rapid reaction. Hey, and you know we got Buck IQ with Zach Bourne. For sure. We got recruiting breakdowns with Berm. We got whatever you need. Ohio State football and Ohio State Athletics. We've got you covered here at Letterman Row.